So let me spend a couple of words to introduce our speakers of today. It's Dr. Fabio Poiesi at Fondazione Bruno Kessler. For me, it's a real pleasure to introduce Fabio. Uh, we invite uh, PIs from all over the world, but we also have a quite strong PI also here in Trento. So it's, uh, it's really good to hear his experience uh, uh, as a young PI. Uh, I also love the title, Good Practice <laughs> Learn as a Young PI. In particular, Fabio will talk uh, also about uh, his experience uh, on uh, managing uh, and performing research uh, on a European project, uh, uh, the SHIELD project. Uh, Fabio uh, did the his PhD and I guess also some year as postdoctoral researcher at uh, uh, Queen Mary University of London and then decided to come back in Italy and now is a tenor track researcher at Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Uh, so please Fabio. Thank you Lisa for your kind presentation. So uh, yes, yes, as Lisa said, um, here I want to tell my story um, about being a PI and uh, in particular I would like to talk about my experience in uh, managing projects but also writing grants and thinking about grants. And in particular, in this presentation, I would like to acknowledge the SHIELD project, which is a project that is funded by MOOL and um, in the European Union Joint Programme Initiative. I will talk about extensively uh, about SHIELD in the course of the presentation. So um, why I am here? Um, well, um, First of all, I have some experience in raising funds and managing projects and people. And um, I also received a suggestion to, to participate to this uh, seminar in order to give um, and to propose it, to explain my experience. And uh, in particular, I have to be honest, this is uh, my first presentation that is non-technical. Typically, I used to give presentations like either in conferences about papers or at uh, Euro uh, European uh, projects about advancements on the projects. But here is a little bit different because I have to talk about non-technical skills. So, yeah. So what I will present, um, well, I will go through my personal past and current experiences on project as a principal investigator, as I said. And uh, I try to make it interesting in the sense that I would try to assess uh, successes and failures, which I can I find useful, and uh, also to go through the feedback that we received uh, in some uh, projects from the reviewers. And also because there is a rather scarce availability of reviews of accepted and rejected project proposals online. Now you start seeing, um, like for example, with open reviews that for conferences, especially in the machine learning uh, field, you have this open review system where you can go through the, the reviews uh, and the conversations between reviewers and authors. But for projects, as far as I know, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I haven't seen anything uh, for, for project proposals. So this is what I would like to, to do here. So uh, my background, uh, as Lisa said, I did my PhD in electronic engineering and computer science at Queen Mary University of London. Um, over there, I participated to one European project. It was an FP7 European project. And then I uh, stayed also uh, in Queen Mary for more than two years as a postdoc, um, where I was uh, fully on a European project. There were about uh, 20 partners inside. Um, and then after that, I moved to FBK uh, as a research scientist. And also in the meanwhile, I was uh, doing some teaching at the University of Bolzan. In the Technology of Vision Lab, TAV, um, I've been involved in four European projects, as uh, one as a PI and the other ones as either task leader or work package leader. And then I also follow more than 10 industrial projects two of them as a, as a PI. So just uh, some remarks before starting. So part of the content uh, that I will be explaining in this presentation is my own personal experience. And uh, there is part of the content that is also from uh, peer-reviewed papers. I will provide uh, references to this. 
And as I said before, this is my experience about funded projects. And all the things that you will see in this presentation uh, are not ordered. So it doesn't mean that the first one is more important than the last one. I deem all these things equally important. So the outline is the following. I will begin with the definition of uh, PI and the roles of a PI. I will introduce uh, some projects that the ones uh, I will talk about later in the presentation. I will give some ideas on how to handle ideas. And I will talk about project evaluation criteria, the importance of publishing papers and the importance also of collaborations within projects. And in the end, I will draw some, some conclusions. So who is a principal investigator? So I found this um, definition on this uh, paper uh, titled 10 Simple Rules to Becoming a Principal Investigator, which uh, is published on this peer-reviewed journal, uh, Computational Biology. And here they define a PI as anyone who runs their own research group using funding that they have been awarded to answer their own questions. Well, um, this one is a rather broad definition, which, uh, for example, someone that has an, an individual fellowship, like, for example, a Marie Curie uh, fellowship or a ERC grant could be a PI or someone responsible for some funds. And uh, of course, like a head of the lab, because he has a budget to, uh, to manage, lecturer, professors, and et cetera. And in my case, uh, I identify myself inside this um, fund responsible. So a typical uh, career path is typically you do your PhD, you do your postdoc, and then in the postdoc, you develop some skills. Perhaps you want to uh, continue and becoming a PI. And this is like a fairly standard, like who becomes PI before and who becomes PI afterwards. In the, um, in the presentation, I will mainly talk about two projects. So the first one is SUGAR. It's a Eurasia project. Um, here I acted as the coordinator. So I coordinated the writing up of the, of the proposal. And SUGAR was about uh, collecting crowdsourced videos. For example, people recording public events. And here the idea was to uh, use the videos collected by people to reconstruct the event in four dimension, like 3D plus time. And with the idea then to experience, to re-experience actually the, the event in um, either in virtual reality or using uh, augmented reality. This project, uh, unfortunately, um, got rejected. So I will use it as a as a, an unsuccessful project, but to go through still the feedback that we received. The other project is instead SHIELD, which is this project um, I talk about in the acknowledgement at the beginning, in which um, I am a principal investigator for uh, FBK. The coordinator is in Cyprus. And, and then there is another partner in, Por in Portugal. And the idea of this project is to build a fully autonomous system where you have a drone that is used to monitor if there are any illicit activities in archaeological sites. So th this drone has some onboard AI. And the idea is to detect these looters that they go in these sites and they do looting activities and eventually to, um, to send a signal to the operation control center to, for example, if there are some, um, if there is the police in order to act. And this drone can go back to his um, ground station to recharge and plan the next mission uh, autonomously. And the, the part related to uh, that we are doing in FBK is the computer vision part. And this one, of course, is a successful project um, that we talk about. So uh, what are the duties of a PI? So I think, um, that is everything uh, needed to successfully complete uh, your project. So because you are the responsible of uh, your project, you really need to try to do as much as possible in order to successfully complete it. And in the, um, <clears throat> in the reference I gave before, they list a series of um, responsibility like fundraising, fund managing, purchasing material, and so on. And, uh, 
this is to say that you really you really require task parallelization skills. So you have a lot of things that you have to do, and you need to be very good in switching between tasks really efficiently. Here I, I listed an unknown exhaustive list of duties. For example, uh, purchasing materials and equipment, fundraising, fund managing, training and managing staff, writing, perhaps like eventually doing also some lab work, keeping updated with the research, planning future research, publicizing research, partnering, teaching, mentoring, listening to people, motivating people. So it's a really full list of things that you need to do at the same time. They need to be good in try to uh, switch between tasks efficiently. Then um, the other thing is to try to have ideas and ask for feedback. So one important thing is the creativity. This is very important to be a PI. And discussing ideas with other people is also very important. However, you need to consider that ideas are rather fragile. So um, at the beginning, when you have an idea, you need to try to understand when it's uh, mature enough in order to, when you share it with others, not let the others to focus on the negative aspects of this idea. And I like to see the process as something like this. So you have your set of ideas, you iterate yourself the, um, the idea to understand whether it is feasible or not. And then perhaps you, sh you share it with other people. And then you do this iterative process to get to a point in which you will eventually at the end execute the idea when you think the idea is mature enough. So this um, sort of iteration with colleagues, uh, I think is very key. And um, you need to ask uh, to your collaborators or even friends for continuous feed feedback because uh, the more you can iterate your idea with your peers, with your colleagues, the more it will help you to improve the quality of the work that you are proposing. And uh, by keeping yourself open to criticism and trying to exploit them, I think it's a, a very good and effective way to, to have a good quality work uh, at the end as a final result. So when you have to assess the feasibility of your ideas, one suggestion could be to try to balance between the originality and the challenges of the idea that you are proposing. So here, for example, from the SHIELD project, one review that we received is that um, the SHIELD project is characterized by a sound and reliable concept proposing new measures and instruments aiming to protect and continuously safeguard archaeological areas. So the reviewers have identified that the, the idea is sound, that is reliable. Uh, later, they said that it is actual and a, pro a promising project. There is a good level of ambition and innovation and originality. So the, uh, the potential is hence high. However, on the other hand, like from the sugar project, the one that I said at the beginning got rejected. Yes, the reviewers have identified that the strength is that the problem is uh, challenging, but the weakness is that it was a too huge problem to be tackled in three years. So probably one of the things that we should have uh, focused on was on a subset of the problem. By proposing and by um, saying that we are going to tackle a really big problem, probably the, the, this is not the best way to go because it might end up in the end not concluding anything. So rather focus on something very specific and not too huge. So but what are the evaluation criteria that you typically receive? So here I took some examples from the JPI project. So reviewers will be assessing um, the research excellence, so the quality of the project in terms of uh, how is the project, if, if the project is sound, if the solution is interesting, then they're going to evaluate the potential impact of the, of the project, and they're going to uh, evaluate the quality and the efficiency of the implementation and how the management of the project is done as well 
and then they're going to focus on the strength and the weaknesses as you as you saw before here below i gave a um, link if you want to have a look to this um, template for the horizon europe program where you can find good um, guidelines to to to, to write um, grants then um, the original project is similar so they are asking to, to evaluate the scientific and scholarly quality, to um, evaluate the methodology and the feasibility of the proposal. For example, focusing on the collaborative approach, the integration of the approach, and the scientific contribution of the different partners. And again, they're going to then evaluate the research-related qualifications of the researchers involved, and then provide an overall evaluation again on the strength and the weaknesses. And then if this applies to your project, then there will be these uh, ethical uh, issues. So I would like to show you um, like one of the reviews that we received for this case, like strengths and weaknesses. So in this case, uh, this is um, a review that we received uh, about the uh, Eurasia project. So the one that got rejected, so they, Reviewers identified that the goal was ambitious. It was um, then the, 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 the proposed pipeline is generally sound. So we managed to convey the message that the pipeline is likely to produce results toward, uh, towards the goal, that the problem was original again. Then we have that um, we, we, we managed to uh, propose a good dissemination plan. So another thing that you have to do in your project is to try to uh, to show that you can uh, disseminate your research either via papers or via uh, public events to, uh, for example, a broader audience of uh, the research that you're doing. Then uh, we have a reasonable uh, cooperative arrangement within the project. So we, we managed to, to find uh, some issues in the state of the art, and then uh, to propose a valuable contribution. That the competences of the consortium uh, were, were good. So we had the right skills for the reviewers, of course, to, uh, to do the project. And that the budget was, uh, was very well planned. So also the budget is something that you have to do in your project and is to be um, reasonable. So in terms of weaknesses, instead, what they have identified is that um, it was not very precise. So we identified something in the, it was a technical aspect. And the reviewer said that um, one specific thing was not very well uh, discussed. So one, one suggestion is when you, when you write a technical description, try to be as precise as possible. This is really important. Otherwise, you will lose some points over there. Then another thing they identified is that the risks were not really um, identified properly. So in a, in a proposal, you need to even, so because it's a research project, you might have some risks. And the good, the important thing that you have to do is to find a good uh, mitigation plan for these risks. It's important to, to show that you are aware of the risks and in case how to, how to address them. So some, again, some parts of the methodology, uh, they were not clear. So another thing is try to be as clear as possible. And here one recommendation could be to try to ask other people that never seen the, pro the proposal to try to give you a feedback. Again, we go back to your uh, collaborators to try to involve them and, and give you uh, criticism. And then another thing that we failed to do was to provide a good description of the interaction between partners. That this is very important because at the end, the solution, the different pieces that every partner will have to implement uh, needs to be integrated. And this is a very important aspect of the, of the success of the proposal. And then uh, at the end, again, they were reiterating on the risks that uh, the reviewer judged that was uh, incomplete. 
So I went through a list of possible uh, feedback that you might receive from, from a reviewer. And this is uh, something that you should try, like in this case, to avoid. And in the end, the reviewers will be asked to, to provide, to give a score. And typically it's a score that goes between one to five. And what you should target is to get the maximum as possible. A reviewer should get to the point in which he says, I don't see any weaknesses from this perspective and it evaluates that part, that description, that um, point as excellent. What you don't want to focus or what, what you don't want to target is the uh, receive like uh, intermediate results, like very good. Like a reviewer, for example, said overall, I will rate the quality of the scientific presentation as very good. This is, you don't want to have this because the competition is very, very high and uh, you should target to, to do everything as excellent as possible. Another thing is uh, the state of the art. So you should have a full knowledge of the literature that is, that is related to the topic of your project. And um, in, in one project, we, we said, okay, the, the reviewer said, while many key competing platform and groups are identified with a provided bibliography, I were to suggest an improvement for completeness in the food, for the modeling domain. So it was the, the topic that we were addressing and it was suggesting further discussions related to some people in the field. And it was suggesting that we could have added more, uh, more references and say more work. And in fact, for this section, although it was decent, we got a very good that is um, a way to basically reduce the, the final score that is the one that you want to instead maximize. Another thing is uh, the, the impact of your, of your project. So try to think beyond the project. So based on the knowledge of the literature that you have assessed, try to propose long-term contribution for your research community. So, um, for example, in the case of sugar, although it failed, we identified one aspect that was the lack of the data uh, related to the task that we wanted to solve. And the reviewer said it could be an extremely useful contribution to the entire research community. So the broader the impact of your project, the better. And in the shield, um, in addition to uh, the, 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 the research community, we, we, we succeeded in also including public administrations and local communities. So as I said before, the broader the impact, the better. So also for uh, non-related research um, fields, let's say. The other very important thing is uh, publishing papers. So from the uh, reference I showed before, they, they mention uh, the main thing you need on your CV is paper and preferably uh, first author papers. Why this? I think that um, I also think that this is important because when you when you're a PI and you submit your proposal, you don't have the uh, opportunity unless for some um, individual fellowships to have a face to face interview. So you need to prove on a paper uh, that you can do the research that you are asking in your grant. And the only way to do it is to show with evidence that you have a certain background in some, uh, in some scientific field. So having papers and showing that you are the first author and you can lead, that you are really into the, uh, the research of that field, that is a very strong um, evidence. So in the sugar, although it was rejected, uh, we managed to, to show that um, we have like excellent contribution in the, in the field. We have good publication record in high quality venues. And also the, another reviewer said that the strong record, uh, track record of publication is um, actually uh, quite good for, for each of the applicants. So all the three reviewers have identified that we were um, in line with the with that particular skills so here i, I found um, another paper titled um, publication metrics and success on the academia job market 
that is published in this uh, peer reviewed journal called um, Current Biology. And here in this paper, what they do, they basically take a machine learning approach and they use it to try to see if uh, becoming a PI is predictable. So they, they use um, 25 um, scientist profiles that they took from PubMed and they show that the actual success in academia is predictable. So they use uh, data to, to understand this. And what they found is basically, um, so the first point is fairly obvious. They say that authors with more first author publications and with more papers in high impact factor journals are more likely to become PIs. And this is uh, fairly obvious. They also said that this is consistent with the idea that the current age index is predictive of future uh, scientific success. So here there is another reference. So if you want to look into the, de the, the, the detail of the data that they collected, you can go in the paper. And um, uh, they also found that um, many scientists who will become PIs, they never published in high impact factor journals. However, these authors have a twofold increase in their first author publication rate compared to authors who do not become PI. So the lack of uh, high impact factor journals can be compensated if you have a much higher number of publications as a first author, suggesting that more first author publications per year can compensate for this. And then they go on and they say that uh, they also found that uh, authors with more first or second author publications are more likely to become PI. Why they find that more middle author publications are of no help unless they are published in high impact factor journals. So try to really be the lead author when you make your publication because based on the correlations, based on the numbers that they found, they, they saw that otherwise it's not of no help if you are a middle author of papers. Of course, this is like, then we can have a very long debate about if these uh, metrics are um, fair, but I mean, this is what they, they found on the data they analyzed. So another thing is to, to try to develop um, diversified skills. So in the, in the paper, they said that uh, one of the main differences when you become PI is lab and technical work. So as a PI, the amount of time you will spend doing raw science will dramatically decrease. And one of the most important skill in the end is uh, to write very well, because you will not be doing some raw science, but that time will be compensated by writing grants or helping students writing papers, basically. Um, and of course, when you are in this type of environment, you need to learn how to work with other people and try to get uh, some uh, management experience. So here I added a non-exhaustive list of examples for building this type of experience, which I think could be important, like for example, supervising students. So if you can dedicate time to, 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 to supervise students, this is a good way to, to try to learn some management skills, especially uh, try to seek for a multicultural environment. It's not obvious to supervise students from different cultures. So by, by doing this exercise, I think it's, um, it's a useful, um, it could be a useful experience. So try to propose yourself also being responsible for lab purchases, organizing seminar presentations. Like for example, if you need to make a budget, you need to know how to um, handle hardware and things like that. So if you have already prior experience about lab purchases, this could be, could be useful. Try to be involved in project management. So if someone, some colleagues is writing a paper, try to propose yourself to be either task leader at the beginning, work package leader, just to have a sense of uh, what are the duties and try to build then um, your, your experience. So be involved in writing grants and seek for collaborations. So um, then uh, regarding collaboration, 
I think uh, the more you know your collaborators, the better, because when you write a grant, you need to convince the reviewers that uh, the collaboration within the consortium uh, are seamless. So the, when you get to the integration part, you need to know all the pieces of your pipeline. And the more you iterate it with your collaborators, the better you will have this knowledge in order to explain it into, into your proposal. So travel, socializing, uh, partnering, these are all key things that you should be doing in order to create this network of uh, collaborators. This is something that, as I said at the beginning, we failed to do in the SUGAR project. And in fact, the reviewer, one of the things he said is that the reader doesn't get a clear sense of the key interpartner integration risks and how they are to be addressed. So if you fail to do this, of course, you have less, your project is less likely to be funded. So um, no matter, I would say, how focused you are, um, you're going to fail. So, and this is, uh, this shouldn't be a big problem because one good exercise that someone can do is to look again at your rejected uh, papers or grants and try to go through the reviewer's feedback in, in order to improve the quality of the work that you, that you proposed. And you can see it as a, a system where you submit your work, either you succeed or you fail. But when you fail, if you implement this mechanism of revising and resubmitting, you, the, the, the chances that your proposal will get accepted, they, they increase at every iteration. And in the paper, in this reference that I gave at the beginning, that later you will see, that uh, I will show it also at the end, they provide some numbers, how likely it is to get a proposal accepted after reiteration of some failures. So, um, and this to say also another important feature is to try to depersonalize as much as possible these failures. So try to do, try to separate as much as possible your personal worth from your successes and failures at work. So it's important that uh, all those criticisms that you receive at work, they stay at work, and you should try to find mechanisms to make use of this criticism and this feedback in order to improve your work, uh, your profile at work. And th this has very little to do with respect to uh, your personal worth. So if you can separate these two things, is the best um, probably uh, thing that you can do. So um, I would like to come to the conclusions. So here in this presentation, I try to share some of my personal experiences as a PI and try to list, I think, the, the important one that I managed to, to put together. Uh, I went through a couple of proposals. So um, one was successful and then one that was unsuccessful. Of course, uh, given the title, I presented some good practices. And then uh, I would say that sometimes uh, luck with the reviewers can also help, but your job when you write proposals is to try to maximize the likelihood of getting your project funded. So this is, uh, and this, the points that I touched in this presentation are some recommendations that uh, I hope they will be useful for you. Okay, I, I'm done. Thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, Fabio. Actually, uh, it was a very interesting also for me, you know, that uh, I share some of the, of your opinion, some I don't, but let's see uh, if uh, the young people have some, uh, some questions. Guys, don't be shy. Shy, sorry. I was reading. Ah, okay. Uh, Julieta is asking, uh, how long does it take uh, you to write the proposal? I guess it depends on the proposal, but, uh, uh, but I'll let Fabio on. Yeah, so it really depends. So um, you might have cases where they are asking you to write a proposal in a matter of a week if they are running late. So you, you really need to put together a lot of material and, um, and write a proposal in no time. 
And here, one recommendation for this type of situation is if you can organize your previous proposals in a way that you can recycle the the material as much as possible that would be that would be excellent because it will be uh, material that will be iterated and reiterated so every time it gets like in a, into a better quality so if someone is asking uh, a contribution uh, in no time you have the material uh, that you can give other times instead it could be like uh, it could take a couple of months so you start from the part of thinking the idea together, maybe either with a coordinator or with other collaborators. So it really, it really depends. It's um, it's difficult to say. But now, for example, European projects there are about forty to forty-five pages. So it requires some time to writing, and it also like the more you have experience, the less time you will need to dedicate to the proposal. So I don't have an exact answer on how long does it take. But um, yeah, these are my recommendations. Somebody has other question? Uh, also, Julieta is asking uh, uh, about uh, resubmitting ideas that has been previously rejected. Yeah, I think so. Like, um, yes, um, you can, for example, extend ideas. Like, if you if you want to continue in another in another proposal, like if you want to carry on with the same idea that you had before, of course, you can reiterate it. And um, you can extend it with uh, the, the, the knowledge that you gain in the, um, like in the research field that you are, if you, that you are dealing with. And um, yeah, uh, typically you, you try to get rejected papers or, or rejected uh, proposals. And then by reiterating, maybe adding some new partners, then you can uh, resubmit it to to, to other um, funds, let's say. I guess uh, here, if I am may comment, they also plays a role in the field that you are working on. Uh, because in some fields, uh, innovation is a bit slower than others. Uh, in some fields, uh, even losing six months uh, it's uh, it's make things a bit more tricky. However, perhaps if you keep on doing research on the same uh, topic on the same uh, stream of uh, work, uh, then it's probably easy to learn from failure, as Fabio was uh, suggesting. Uh, but sometimes you also <laughs> want to be brave and write something totally different from what you were doing, and so you have to start the process again. It's always like a compromise between the things. So, but even if you write brave ideas and then you build some experience from from failures, I think the likelihood of having something more successful is much higher than uh, than before. De definitely, definitely. I, I also find very difficult for me. I don't know if this match to your experience to um, submit many proposals but total to balance uh, among submitting several and submitting good quality ones. <laughs> uh, because uh, also submitting just one or two proposals is not uh, uh, rewarding in general, because uh, there, there may be many factors. Uh, however, um, uh, we are reaching a point, at least in artificial intelligence, in my opinion, where uh, uh, the level of uh, uh, competition is very high, so it's also important to, to have uh, uh, very clean proposals. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so Varna is asking, do you recommend follow any particular template for proposals? So, um, so before I gave um, a reference, um, I have some comments uh, anyway. 
So let's go back. So here uh, on the bottom, you see <clears throat> there is a link to, to these um, guidelines that you can exploit. Usually when you submit a proposal to, to some grants, they provide, you a temp they provide you with a template that you can follow and fill every section of this uh, template. But you can build your own template, let's say over time by collaborating with, uh, with, with people and by using both the successful uh, proposals and the, the unsuccessful proposal together with the feedback that you received, you can over time build your, your own template. So in my case, I have the collection of all the projects that have been involved, uh, those successful and unsuccessful. And when I have to provide a contribution, I will go through the best I can get out of this, uh, this uh, material. So again, if, you, if you're able to keep track of all the things that you're doing, by even like asking to other people if they have some uh, recommendations, you can then build a quite um, informative, um, good template for yourself. Thanks. Uh, we may have time for another question. Andrea is asking, what would you change about the current funding process? <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I have um, enough experience to, to provide an answer to this, um, to this question. Um, so, it's um, so currently, it, as Elisa said, it's becoming very, very hard to uh, to to get funding because uh, there are many competitors, and the quality in general of the proposal is getting very, very high, and also the number of uh, submissions is getting very high. So I don't know, like current funding process. Um, I have no idea. The only thing I, I think about is try to really uh, try to do the best proposal as you can and to and to submit it once once you're happy and, and try to build a good uh, group of collaborators in which you trust and you you feel comfortable to to write these proposals. Maybe Elisa on this uh, question has more insights. Bah. Uh, it's also a difficult question for me, I mean, because it also depends on the landscape. Uh, I mean, I've been reviewing proposal uh, uh, in many different organizations, uh, uh, like uh, I, this year I'm reviewing uh, European Research Council, I've been reviewing, uh, so European project, I've been reviewing national project in Sweden, in Poland, in Germany, in Italy and uh, all the different countries have different rules. And so even for, for uh, us, when we are uh, um, asked to review proposals, the um, kind of assessment uh, is, very, uh, is very different from a, a country to another one. Uh, also depends if uh, they are individual fellowship or uh, um, project from consortia. So it, it's really <laughs> a jungle. Uh, personally, I do appreciate a lot the process that they have in Germany, where they had um, multiple level of selection, plus um, also, um, you know, some physical uh, uh, review meeting days. Uh, and so when you really arrive at the end of the project, uh, of the process, uh, I think uh, really the best uh, projects are funded uh, because the selection has been uh, multi-level uh, under different uh, things. Um, in Italy, things uh, are quite different uh, at the moment, uh, but uh, uh, since we are investing a lot of time in writing proposal, I do believe uh, that uh, having uh, such a kind of evaluation as in Germany would be uh, probably uh, appreciated. Uh, as far as I know, there are only, it's only about like these individual fellowships that you can do interviews person to person, right? Like uh, standard projects with um, consortium, usually 
they are judged based on the proposal. On the European, uh, the European, yes, but uh, yeah. um, uh, for Germany also, if you are a small consortium, uh, there, there are there is an interview at the FPGs. Okay, which is uh, the coordinator that is interviewed? Or... Mostly the coordinator and then the work package leader have a very little uh, part in the discussion, but they participate to the thing. Anyway, there is a huge uh, <laughs> effort also on the reviewer side uh, uh, because it's finding also reviewers. It's not, uh, it's not easy these days. So uh, we are over, literally overwhelmed by duties of uh, not just uh, leading our groups, but also participating to services. Yeah. Anyway, I'm also luckily quite young to answer to this question. <laughs> Let's see in a few years. <laughs> but thanks Andrea for the very interesting discussion. Very last question and then uh, I would thank everybody. <laughs> Even more difficult one, huh? <laughs> Paolo is asking a nasty question. How do you pick the right partner for a specific task? Well, in my case, um, we always try to have um, diversified skills. So we try not to get partners that they, they do the same uh, type of research. So the more uh, diversified are the partners, I think the better. So of course they need to be competent, like they need to be people with a good uh, track record of publications of uh, successes in previous projects, but they need to have uh, different skills. So, so they can really give the best to, to that particular um, topic. So, and then you need to, I think one of the things we also do, like if uh, we have, uh, we know each other, uh, it's better because we, we, we can trust each other and we know what we can do and how and when to give these uh, contributions to writing the proposal. So either people that we know and um, people that they can do uh, things differently as well. Okay, I think uh, at this point uh, we we can close. Uh, I would like to thank first of all uh, Fabio for uh, such a very nice presentation and also for uh, uh, stay available and uh, answer to all the questions. I also would like to remind uh, to all the people that attended today that we will have another uh, uh, kind, uh, similar uh, seminar next week at uh, lunchtime uh, with Professor Emanuele Rodola from uh, La Sapienza University of Rome, who uh, was uh, recently awarded with an ERC starting grant. Uh, and so the ERC starting grant is really probably the, the most prestigious uh, grant that you can have as a young PI in, in Europe. Uh, so I will like to invite you to attend uh, if you can. Thank you everybody again and see you next time. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.